Welcome to the Healthy Skin Show with Jennifer Fugo, where we're flipping everything you've been told about your chronic skin issues upside down and connecting you with alternative solutions your dermatologist never told you about. Show. In today's episode, we're going to be talking about different metals and chemicals that are used in dentistry that can cause problems. Things like mercury, fluoride, and even whitening chemicals. My guest today, Dr. Kelly J. Blodgett, is actually a returning guest. If you might recall, he spoke with us the last time all about the problems that can result from root canals. And not just root canals gone wrong, but root canals in general. If you didn't tune into that episode, allow me the opportunity to introduce you to Dr. Blodgett. He's a recognized leader in holistic and integrative biological dentistry, a published researcher, author, and top clinician. His educational background in psychology, traditional dentistry, naturopathic medical dentistry, and integrative biological dental medicine provides him with a unique perspective as a healthcare provider. He understands and respects the interconnectedness of oral health, systemic health, and the feelings and emotions which accompany most people's dental experiences, and his professional vision is to reverse the negative stereotype associated with dentistry by sharing loving care in an environment free from judgment. I know that you are going to love this information. So without further ado, let's dive in. Thanks so much for joining us back on the show, Dr. Blodgett. I'm, I'm really excited to have you after our first conversation, which I know for many people listening probably blew their minds if they've never heard the whole connection between root canals and the microbiome issues that can result be, from these sort of like hidden infections. But I really appreciate you coming back again because I feel like we have just so much more to talk about. Well, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. This is awesome. So today I wanted to talk about mercury and fluoride and just other chemicals that tend to get used in the mouth that I think we take for granted as being kind of normal. I think some people have concerns over mercury and I, I'm assuming mercury is mostly when we talk about that in terms of dentistry is from uh, mercury amalgams and fillings, but um, let's start with that. Let's talk a little bit about mercury um, and what type of fillings. Because I know, too, like I've only had one filling done ever, and it was, I think, a ceramic or epoxy or something. So I don't know if, though, if you have thoughts on those, too, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on sure. mercury and how that can impact what's going on in your mouth and your health. Sure. Well, you know, I'll start off by sharing just a, a brief bit of history on mercury Please. Uh, in, in the mouth, right? So, you know, around 200 years ago, when the mercury filling was first developed, um, the what was initially the, the first version of the American Dental Association called the American College of Dental Surgeons um, knew and, and they recognized that you know, that was incredibly unsafe to put mercury inside somebody's mouth where, you know, the vapors come off. They knew that you'd inhale it. They knew there'd be transmucosal absorption, uh, you know, get into your gut lining. And that group said, hey, if you're going to be a member of this, you know, upstanding uh, dental professional group, you, you will agree to not use it. And, and at the time, of course, it was such a, you know, there weren't a lot of great resources. We didn't have glass ionomers and composites and ceramics and all that. Um, so I can, I can appreciate why it was, you know, being pushed because uh, it was technique, relatively technique insensitive. But ultimately, it ended up causing the, the fall of that uh, original group of dental practitioners um, because nobody would adhere to not using it, even though they knew how unsafe it was, right? So we fast forward 200 years, um, you know, there are a number of countries, particularly in Europe, who banned the use of uh, mercury dental amalgams. Um, I mean, I, I can honestly say that in my 21 years of practice, uh, I, I've only placed one, and it was in the first year I practiced, and then, you know, we subsequently tossed all that stuff. Um, so it's, you know, half of 
amalgam fillings, which, which people, um, normally they hear about them from their dentist as a silver filling, right? Okay. We, we, we sell it as this like, oh, it's silver, right? Every, who doesn't love a semi-precious metal, you know? <laughs> um, but, but in fact, I mean, half of it uh, is mercury, liquid mercury. The other half is shavings of copper, tin, and silver. So, you know, it's kind of a hodgepodge uh, of stuff, not to mention, you know, formation of a battery in your mouth. But the mercury, especially at mouth temperature, is constantly giving off mercury vapor. And mm. for years, the American Dental Association was staunchly saying, well, there's no science that proves that, blah, blah, blah. And just this year, they actually came out with a, a press release acknowledging, well, okay, you know, in fact, we, we actually will acknowledge that, in fact, uh, mercury vapor does come off. And, but, you know, we don't think that it's uh, at dangerous levels for adults. For kids under six, yes. For pregnant women, yes. But apparently for, you know, anybody over than six, uh, older than six, <laughs> it's not somehow unsafe. So, I mean, go figure how they, how they work that one out. But um, so for, it's kind of crazy. So you're saying for 200 years... Yeah, we th so this is a this is not like a new thing. That's that is no, that's ridiculous that that is so well, you, old and it took to 2020. The, yeah, you remember that the Mad Hatter syndrome, you yes. know, from Alice in Wonderland. I mean, the, the whole Mad Hatter syndrome came because they would use liquid mercury with the felting of hats. And, you know, you get the, the transdermal absorption through your skin while you're working with liquid mercury. And, you know, we've known for centuries how dangerous this stuff is. Um, and we're talking like, you know, as, as an example, I use with patients frequently, you know, if one of the, the light bulbs that we have, uh, if it were to contain mercury and it landed on the floor and, and had a, a light break, you know, like a compact, sure. compact fluorescent bulb, you know, if you look up online, like what is the appropriate, uh, protocol for cleaning that up? I mean, it involves a hazmat suit and, and we're talking like, you know, maybe a couple milligrams of, of mercury, mm -hmm. like, like still it's kind of not good, but, but not a ton on average, like the average mercury filling that goes into a single tooth has 500 milligrams of mercury in one filling. Oh my gosh. So you, imagine somebody who has, you know, let's say eight or 10 mercury fillings or more. Uh, that is an insane amount of toxic material that, wow. We're putting in teeth and telling them that's for your health. It's it's insane. And so when you're saying it's releasing vapors, does that then imply that every time you swallow, you're potentially ingesting? No, you are, you are ingesting and okay. you are inhaling. So and you think about like, so let's, let's imagine somebody who uh, is a mouth breather at night, mm -hmm. right? And these things are constantly giving off vapor and, and they're breathing it in through their lungs. We know, I mean... We know that uh, lung absorption is great. That's why people get a kick out of smoking things. You know, I mean, it's just right across the lung membranes. And hey, I feel different. Well, you don't feel the mercury necessarily initially. Some people might, but uh, most people, it's like long-term effects of mm -hmm. that slow and low exposure that does get absorbed and does preferentially bind to neuro, uh, like neurological tissues, fat cells. Um, it's, it's, and it's hard to get rid of for, for some people who don't, uh, mind mm -hmm. and process it effectively. It's hard to detox from it. So what about someone who use it, who has, um, fillings like that are gold or the epoxy ceramic type? Like, are you, do you also have a mercury exposure there? Or are those different? Uh, those would be different materials. Okay. However, Okay. Let's say let's say you've got a gold crown or it's a gold mm -hmm. substructure, what we call a, a PFM or a porcelain infused to metal crown. Mm -hmm. um, I cannot count how many times I'm cutting those off for people, and you know they want to go to all ceramics or something, and you cut the crown in half to pop it off, and underneath they've left the mercury filling from the prior filling, you know, and so you've got mm -hmm. two dissimilar metals in contact, which forms a battery which forms electrical current flow along that energetic meridian that the tooth is on. So it's, it's, it's a real issue. Um, and, and I, you know, there are millions upon millions of people walking around 
feeling horrible, you know, uh, whatever their, their biological system is that's offline and not working well. And nobody's asking about, Hey, what, what's in your mouth? You know, is it possible yeah. that you have, you have infection or dissimilar metals or toxic exposures? Mm. Um, you know, so it's got to become part of the, the list of questions that we ask in a full health workup. So with the mercury, then for somebody listening to this, and they've been concerned about this for a while, like you were saying, maybe they have a number of fillings of the silver, the silver metal. Mm -hmm. Um, That seems like a big undertaking (laughs) to get that swapped out. What does that look like? Like, what do you have to mentally be prepared for if you're going to do something like this? Sure, sure. It's a good question. Well, first and foremost, I would suggest that um, anybody who's interested in, in learning more about that, that they either go to the websites of the IAOMT or the IABDM. And so they can just put in IABDM.org and, uh, or .com. I can't remember which it is, but, you know, look those up. Those are really reputable dental groups who have established protocols for mm. safe removal of, uh, mercury. And so like, we have a lot of very specialized equipment in, in my practice, um, in, in each of the rooms, like not just one room, like we've equipped all of our rooms with, you know, mercury suction systems and, and things so that anytime we're taking off a crown, like, let, like, let's say we're not even sure if there's mercury in the tooth, we always practice the protocol for safety, right? Um, so you, you want to find a dentist who is, is well experienced in the process of safe removal the process itself, uh, from a clinical standpoint, and what you experience, it's no different than if you went in for, you know, a, a filling in a tooth, right? You're going to usually, most people just choose to go with uh, local anesthesia. There's a whole isolation process of the teeth so that you're not exposed and the practitioners aren't exposed. Um, and then you go about, you know, safely removing the, the metal filling material. And then however you replace it is kind of a that's something you decide with your dentist, right? Mm -hmm. Like there's no one way that's like, Oh, this is the only way. Right. I mean, every situation is unique. Um, we have a a number of different modalities that we utilize and it just kind of depends on how big is the hole in the tooth? Um, what are we trying to accomplish? Is this a front tooth? Is it a back tooth? Um, you know, all, all those, those things that we consider when looking at what's the least invasive way and most predictable long term way of restoring the tooth, right? Yeah, man, it is it. I've I've had some clients that they're like, I'm gonna start doing it. But it's a it's a process. It's not fast. And they've got to find somebody that can handle it. Because most regular dentists are of the mindset that what they're what's in your mouth is fine. Except when you start having really serious health issues, and you become increasingly concerned about what's like, just literally sitting in your mouth that you can't walk away from. Yep. That's that's a totally different matter. And so um, I, I want to switch gears because I think, too, when we talk about what we're exposed to, there's this big sure. push, uh, you know, and I remember as I think I was in like my later high school years after I had my braces taken off of like wanting to whiten my teeth. And now mm-hmm. the the teeth whitening systems, I mean, you can go to the pharmacy and buy one. I mean, you can you can right. buy anything. Um, You know, for people who maybe have teenagers or they've considered themselves Mm -hmm. wanting to whiten their teeth, do you have any thoughts as far as those type of exposures are concerned of what they may be doing to your teeth or in your mouth or anything like that? Well, yeah, I do. I have a lot of thoughts about that. Um, And I think that in today's culture, I mean, there's this crazy irony, right? Uh, The day of the selfie. (laughs) <laughs> where everybody wants to look, look, you know, like we yeah. all want to look a certain way. We want our super bright smile, but we've also, you know, have, you know, the, the kind of the Starbucks phenomenon where every 13 year old needs to have a Starbucks in their hand, you know, and they're sipping on, you know, highly staining substances. Yeah. So I think first and foremost, if you were to ask me like, well, you know, uh, something about, you know, I want to get my, my laundry as white as I can get it, but I spend most of the day rolling in the mud you know, we have to ask ourselves to what are we exposing our, our teeth in the first place, right? Um, so if you're a constant staining uh, beverage or food eater and drinker, you know, 
how are they getting stained in the first place, right? Mm -hmm. and, and is it an internal color issue, meaning is it actually the dentin of the tooth that is darker, uh, or is it in fact just a stain issue on the external part of the enamel? So, you know, changing the whiteness of the internal aspects of the teeth is an entirely different consideration, which you would probably want to think more about gut health and things like mm -hmm. that, or, or was the person exposed to antibiotics at a young age? And, you know, um, because some antibiotics but, can, can cause teeth discoloration, right. correct? Absolutely. And, and, you know, in those cases, you know, it's pretty darn hard to change the tone, if you will, uh, or the color of a tooth when the internal aspect of it is darker, right? Um, I mean, we have a lot of restorative techniques that are non-invasive for lightening teeth, whether it's non-prep veneers, uh, you know, composites, things like that, where you can additively put something that's say a half a millimeter thick over a tooth to modify the color um, and not damage any of the, uh, the native tooth structure. But, you know, what, what I found in whitening, and, and, you know, I've tried a lot of things on the market. We've had a lot of different whitening systems in the office over the years. Um, and a lot of people find it uncomfortable, mm -hmm. which makes sense. You're putting a caustic material on teeth. And if you have sensitive teeth at all, it's likely to make you more sensitive. Um, and, and oftentimes the results are temporary. Uh, because people keep drinking coffee and wine. Right. You know? I know for yeah, myself, I had acne as a teenager and was given mm -hmm. tetracycline for a long time, yeah. which is known to cause discoloration yes. of your teeth. And then right. I get my braces put on um, and eventually they come off and I'm unhappy with the color of my teeth. Uh, I, I didn't right. drink any coffee or anything and I would have right. issues with staining. But then I did. My dentist said, oh, well, we have these trays and you squirt this gel in and, you know, you wear them to bed. And I can tell you now I'm 40 now, years and years later, my teeth are still, they're, they're better than they were. But throughout my 20s into my early 30s, yeah. I could not, if it was really cold, forget about it. Um, oh, if yeah. For years and years, I had issues with sensitivity. And in hindsight, I thought to myself, you know, what is in that that I am potentially swallowing as well? Mm hmm Right. Well, and that, that's another good point, right? Like, I mean, you know, generally you're using some sort of peroxide. So it's, um, you know, if you're comfortable with hydrogen peroxide and probably like most things, a little bit of exposure to something isn't going to kill us. Right. Um, but if it's something that we're doing with great frequency, um, you know, it, it just depends on the person, right? What's, what's, how frequently do you use it? Um, how does it affect your GI health, right? What's your what's your GI floor to begin with? Mm. Um, yeah, it's there's there's so many considerations with that. And you make an excellent point. In the day of, and this is horrible, but in the day of retractive orthodontics, which is what people were doing when I was a kid, and you know, I'll be turning 50 soon. You know, the idea was like, well, let's pull out premolars, let's squish yep. the arches. And so all the teeth go from being slightly flared which in a natural position for most people looks aesthetic. It reflects light. Well, it makes the teeth look more light. And then we squish everything back, make the teeth much more vertically inclined, if not retroclined. So they absorb light and look darker. Mm. So just the position in which we place teeth uh, from an orthodontic standpoint for a lot of people, not all certainly, but for a lot of people makes it challenging. Uh, even if they do lighten their teeth, they never really have the appearance that like, oh, they're actually a lot lighter because they absorb light. Yeah. Can I ask you, um, I know there's a lot of also this like trend toward um, activated charcoal being added to toothpastes and they have like the powders that they claim are whitening. Do you feel like mm. that's a legitimate thing? Or then I'm thinking to myself as you're talking about the mercury, I'm like, oh, well, is that even safe if you have merc mercury amalgams? Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, I, you know, I, I don't, to be honest, I, I have a lot of patients who come in and, and tell me they're trying this or that or the other. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, honestly, like most people are exposing their mouths to whatever dentifrice they're using for two to four minutes out of a day. 
So out of the, how many minutes are in a day, <laughs> you know, like it, the exposure is relatively minimal. Uh, what I would say is if somebody finds that it works for them and they're happy with it, Hey, that's awesome. You know, if it works, it works. Um, and I, I generally recommend to most of my patients to check out the, I think it's called the healthy living app now by the uh, environmental working group. Um, it's so helpful to use that app to scan barcodes of material or uh, like toothpaste, soaps, mm -hmm. and anything that you want to get at a store, you can scan it and it'll give you a relative toxicity guide on a scale of one to 10. And I think that's awesome, right? If you're, yeah. if you're wanting to try three different toothpastes, well, you know, part of your uh, thought process might be just looking up um, how, how safe is this from a toxicity standpoint or from a, a chemical exposure standpoint, right? Yeah. Absolutely. And and I think actually from from that, it would be a great kind of like sidestep to just like talk briefly a little bit about fluoride. I've had one guest who came on the show very early on and she talked about how she discovered fluoride seemed to aggravate her acne. And, you know, we have fluoride yeah. exposure as a kid. I remember they would treat my teeth with fluoride and then oh, we'd yeah. have some water is fluorinated. Mine currently I found out is not because I learned how to read my water report. But what are your oh, thoughts? Thoughts on fluoride? Well, uh, first and foremost, I mean, despite what the American Dental Association is going to tell you, which, you know, of course, they can spin up any uh, quote unquote science uh, that they want, I guess they've got the money to do it. But um, in my clinical experience, it doesn't matter whether somebody's exposed to fluoride or not. I don't see that it actually um, reduces decay risk mm. if you're constantly sipping on you know, uh, you know, your mocha frappuccino or, uh, your kombucha or whatever, right? Like if you're constantly exposing yourself to sugars and acids, it doesn't matter what's in the water, but it, with respect to fluoride, what, what I have looked up over the past few years, because I just find it interesting is the extent to which we understand that fluoride does cause neurological damage in, particularly in developing neurological tissue. So for mm. children, uh, there are a lot of studies that show significant decrease in neurological functioning from exposure to fluoride. And, and I'm, a, I'm right there with you, Jen. I mean, I remember being a kid in grade school and they'd bring those gosh awful trays in there. And, <laughs> yep. and you know what I mean? You're like, oh, we got to sip that. And then everybody, you know, goes and spits in the sink after 30 seconds of torture. And it's like, for what? I mean, is it probably five minutes later, we were having orange slices, you know, uh, meanwhile, our oral mucosa, which is a, so absorptive, right? We think about why do we, why does a person with a, a acute angina throw nitroglycerin under their tongue? Well, because we absorb things like, like rapid fire. Mm -hmm. And so what does that fluoride do, right? When we, when we're absorbing it in our mouths at high concentrations, uh, that's scary. And, and what's also kind of spooky, if you think about it, so somebody who has, um, let's say, what we would call high caries risk, or meaning for whatever reason, dietary uh, hab habits, who knows, they're forming a lot of decay, and the dentist says, well, we need to get you on a high fluoride dentifrice, you know, like a five 5,000 parts per million uh, fluoride dentifrice. So, you know, go home and use this two times a day, and you're going to be absorbing that stuff like crazy oh in your mouth. And, and, you know, people wonder why we see such a, a you know, heightened uh, frequency of neurocognitive, uh, neurodegenerative diseases. It's like, well, we keep exposing ourselves to more and more toxic garbage and somehow expecting that it won't have an effect. Right. But, in an I area, mean, like you're saying, this is an area yeah. that is highly absorptive. I mean, right. you know, Absolutely. we do a lot of su like in clinical nutrition, we have sublingual B12. We'll do things with liposomal vitamins yeah, yeah, and nutrients yeah. and you yeah. hold it in your mouth under the tongue. Right. That's right. And, and that's exactly what we're doing with fluoride. And on a daily basis, a lot of people know, oh, my my whatever, you know, my Colgate, my Crest, my blah, blah, blah. You know, it's so awesome. It whitens my teeth. And it's like, you know, that slow and low exposure will catch up to many people, not all, but many. 
Yeah. I mean, that was one one big impetus for me because I didn't know, number one, if I had fluoride or not. So I got a really good water filter so that I I was like, well, I'm going to try and take out everything that I can, you know, any impurities from the water and then got rid Mm -hmm. of the fluorinated uh, toothpaste, which actually it's hard. It's it's getting easier to find non fluorinated toothpaste, but it's still sometimes at a regular grocery store, a challenge um, or a regular pharmacy. And, you know, I've also made a lot of efforts too. like I was saying, um, Laura Adler, who many of you might remember, she was talking about on the, the Healthy Skin Show. And we'll link to that podcast about how to learn to read your water company's water report <laughs> so you can know what's in your water. Because a lot of times there's things that we can't quite filter out or we assume because it's common knowledge, I'm putting that in air quotes, uh, that you know everything mm-hmm. must have have uh, fluoride, for example, or chlorine, but that may not be the case. I don't have either of those in my water, but I have chloramine. So I know that. So I think it's important that we consider all different avenues of understanding our exposures. And I think you've brought up a really great point about the how we should really also to take care of that tissue under, especially under the tongue, because you can absorb so much. And that could include, it could include good things like liposomal vitamin C or liposomal glutathione, but it could also include things that may not, that may actually be detrimental to you. Yeah. Well, for those people who are thinking like, well, is that, is that true? You know, I mean, I really encourage people to do some light research, you know, go on PubMed uh, you know, and, and just pull up a search. You can type in fluoride, you know, comma, uh, you know, neurodegenerative, or like put in Alzheimer's or something like that, you know, and just start doing some searches or, or look at IQ deficiencies. Yeah. Um, and all, all the science is there Yeah. Uh, on humans, right? Yeah. So it's, I'm not just making this stuff up. It's, it's all out there. And it was kind of shocking to me because of course I grew up brushing with crafts and get my fluoride treatments. And, you know, I thought I was a tooth warrior because I'm getting all my <laughs> fluoride. And it's like, you know, now I'm just kind of slowly dumbing myself down apparently. Yeah, we, 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 uh, we're trying, I think at this point, I, at this stage in life, I recognize that knowledge is power and it can be scary at times. And that's why we don't want to like go down too many rabbit holes and then think, oh my gosh, if I, anything I do is going to make me sick. Like, no, just start with what's most critical, make small changes. And then, you know, if you have a mouthful or you have a few, uh, you know, we talked about root canals the last time. So for those of you yeah. who didn't miss that, go back and listen to that because that's really important. But if you have cavities and you have those silver fillings, um, mm. you know, and then you think about like what's in your water and what you're exposing your teeth to, especially for your kids, this this could help you maybe take some small to large actions, but do it within your comfort zone and and what is doable for you. Um, And so I just want to encourage everyone as well, Dr. Blodgett, to go to your website because I've oftentimes referred clients to your website. You have a great blog there with a lot of articles. So um, so for those of you, you're welcome, who are are interested, it's blodgettdentalcare.com and... And the way that I met Dr. Blodgett was on Instagram. And I highly encourage you to go check that out as well. It's at Blodgett Dental Care. And he has just got a lot of great graphics that help you understand things without necessarily feeling like you got to dig through scientific studies. If, if you're the type of person that just needs to see it in order to start grasping, wow, this is a big deal. Maybe I should start looking into this. I, I think that his, I, I don't think anything is to me, if nothing was um, scary, I was just like, oh, wow, I didn't know wow. that. And I want to learn more. So I think it's, I really encourage everyone to go check out those two ways to connect with you because i think that those are some really educational resources that are based in not just science but also your clinical research which i deeply appreciate so you're welcome so i just want to thank you so much for coming back on the show hopefully we'll we'll get you back again sometime and we'll pick your brain and share some more to help people figure out what the heck is going on with their health but i just want to thank you so much for for coming back you appreciated hearing this information from Dr. Blodgett. I always appreciate the things that he brings to the table and what he shares because yes, it is absolutely applicable to what's going on not only at the level of your skin, but also your overall health. 
So if you're looking to dive deeper into the information that we shared, as well as to nail down some more concrete information or references in regards to any like ahas or really great insights that you've had from tuning into this episode, you can head on over to skintorup.com forward slash 206. There, I have all the show notes. And if you've got questions or thoughts, you can post them. That way, we can keep the conversation going. And if you know someone who's been exposed to a heck of a lot of dental work and chemicals like what we've discussed today, this is a great episode to share with them. Remember, sharing is caring and connecting someone with information like this where they can listen, they can learn, they can pull little tidbits and also know what questions to ask. That is such a tremendous gift. So make a point to share this with someone you know who could really benefit from it. And before you run off, go rate and review The Healthy Skin Show and then make a point to hit the subscribe button. That way you never miss a weekly dose of any of the tips and strategies that we share, client stories, case studies, all sorts. 